Um, I'm going to do the second of uh, a little two-sermon series on the topic of life after Easter, or life in light of the resurrection. Um, uh, think about this. If we were in the southern hemisphere, it would be fall. And to me, with Easter, that just doesn't work. <laughs> it's like, he is risen, and now everything dies. But uh, here, now the flowers are popping, and everything's getting green, and it's just a wonderful time. And I want to pray that we, uh, as things are coming to new life, would be able to lay hold of life writ really large. So let's pray. Lord, I pray for your grace to just shine onto our hearts and our minds that we could lay hold of eternal life. Lord, we are so caught up in a world that doesn't see that, doesn't want to acknowledge its existence. And Lord, we can uh, adopt that mindset uh, by default. But Lord, I pray that you would give us grace today to think about these things uh, in a way where you give us grace to see the unseen. You give us grace to have more of a functional understanding and grasp of what it will be like for us personally and those that we love to have eternal life. Lord, we need your help in that. So give us grace in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to build on last week. Jesus abolished death and has brought to life or brought life and immortality to light in the gospel. And that light or illumination, um, quite frankly, it takes some time uh, to purposely bask in or soak in, just to adjust to, uh, because we can, given how the world is created, we can choose to ignore it. Or we can seek to let it shine on our understanding, to see the unseen. Uh, in light of Easter, this is a good time to look at life and death and what we believe. So, first of all, we have a calling from all eternity that is unceasing in its nature. The nature of your call is eternal. And the vast majority of it lies beyond our earthly life for God's own purpose and by his grace. But many of us don't really have functionally in our lives a meaningful concept of eternal life. You can have a vision for something, but that vision may not have a hold of you. Like when um, Peter had the revelation, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, the Father has revealed that to you. And then Jesus started talking about his death, and Peter turns around and rebukes him because his vision of what Jesus being the Christ looked like, he still had in mind the things of men. And he got a pretty stern rebuke about that. And we know that story. So we can have a vision, but the vision really doesn't yet have a hold of us. And I think we can, many of us, believe uh, that we will be with him in the future life, but we don't take time to really let that illuminate our understanding to the point where it really lays hold of how we look at things in our day-to-day -day life. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to um, take a look at two of the foundational verses from last week. First one, 2 Timothy 1, chapter, or, uh, verse, chapter nine, 1, verse 9. Let's say that right. Paul wrote to his apprentice Timothy, God who has saved us and called us to a holy life longer than just this life. Not because of anything that we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The second verse that I'm predicating these uh, messages on is a much more famous, John 11, 25. I am, Jesus said, the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know, if we as believers don't spend time developing an idea about our death that is different 
than what is common in the world around us, which is that at physical death, our life is just over, then we functionally live without that meaningful concept of what happens after we die and how that is actually a part of our lives now, how it applies now. So the question is an abiding one for us. Do you believe this? So I've divided uh, last week and this week into kind of three sections. First of all, what does this mean? And taking a further run at that, we go to a new scripture for this week, and that's 2 Corinthians 4, starting at 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For the momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our outer man or woman person is decaying. That's called aging. <laughs> Sadly, the diseases of age are hitting our population younger and younger. And without taking time to quote current headlines, it's something that is making the headlines with increasing frequency. And it's not just disease, the diseases of aging. Um, but we can start decaying, for example, if we have an injury. I'm of a good weight and have escaped many of the issues of metabolic syndrome and cancer and cardiovascular. So, so far, thank you, Jesus, that are getting really common, even among younger people than me. Um, but I did take out my anterior cruciate ligament in my right knee in about 1977 in a ski accident as a teenager. And back then, they didn't try and fix it. They just put a cast on it and six weeks later, took the cast off. It's like, where'd my leg go? <laughs> um, and that joint has been decaying or aging uh, since before I actually became an adult. And after multiple surgeries and rehab, I am very attuned to my own decaying. And so that can happen to us in many ways, by disease or by injury. So saying our outer man is decaying, some of us have been dealing with that since our young adult times. And now that I'm hitting this year, Medicare age, time flies fast, <laughs> later this year, um, well, I can tell you, testimony, <laughs> age-related stuff accrues. But Paul writes that our inner self is being renewed day by day, even as our outer decays. In fact, he writes that it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Well, I can see and I can feel my knee and other things and have for decades, but the inner is unseen. The outer is temporal, but the unseen is eternal. And last week I hit on God creating the universe in such a way um, that he is unseen and we actually have a real option to ignore him if we so choose. But we also have the choice or option to seek him and find him and choose to love him and devote ourselves to him, to his will, to what he wants, to serve him and to serve others. We have that choice. And the result of doing so enables us to not lose heart. Otherwise, seeing only our outer person decaying, it's disheartening. And death can keep us in a type of slavery, as we looked at last week. But the mind set on the spirit is life, a different kind of life that the, that the Lord has brought to light in the gospel. And it's peace. In fact, Paul says here that it's working for us an eternal weight of glory. Those are kind of a strange combination of words. Far beyond all comparison. What is glory? Well, the light of this world, photons, the electromagnetic spectrum, as far as we can measure, has no weight. But biblically, there is a weightiness to the light of this glory. Kavod in the Hebrew, doxa in the Greek. It's not a thing of this realm but rather something of the eternal realm that sometimes makes its presence known, even though it's from an unseen realm. Sometimes it happens, and then everyone can see, like on the top of Mount Sinai, 
or at the dedication of the temple. The heavens open, so to speak, and that which is there all the time is made visible to us in this realm. And when it does, it is not something that can be ignored. The illumination of light, as in Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light, in the gospel, like I said last week, comes in two ways. First, it's illumination to our mind to see or comprehend that which is unseen. But it's also, and I'm going to talk about this the second part today, it's radiance, it's brilliance. Glory, in this second sense, is shiny. There is a glow associated biblically with eternal life that Jesus brings to light in the gospel, which leads us directly to the second section or the second question, what will it be like? Because an aspect of the life that is so beyond weighing one versus the other, tipping the scales of our decaying and, and our other trials in this life uh, as believers called according to his purpose, is that of all things, it's, it's shiny. And that at first may seem just kind of strange or weird or random, but there it is. So let's look today at a story from Luke. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after this, next verse, he took some who were standing there, Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. And two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. And they spoke about, about his departure, which he would bring about or bring to fulfillment in, uh, at Jerusalem. So these days, or at least this last week, you've heard a lot about looking at a solar eclipse during totality. And if you're in totality, it's safe. But when even a little bit of the sun, not the corona, but the sun itself is showing, it's blinding. And all the headlines are about people's eyes hurting and going to the optometrist this week. Well, lightning is actually hotter and brighter than the surface of the sun. But it's quite short in duration. Well, Jesus, in his transfiguration, his face was changed and even his clothing became as bright as a flash of lightning. But it stayed that way, not just for a second. Well, we're not meant to look right at that. Moreover, Moses and Elijah, they'd already inherited glory as they had died and were on the other side. And they talked with Jesus about his coming death. And what Peter, James, and John got to witness was a little bit of the glory of eternal life, of living in the kingdom of God. And people commonly have all kinds of ideas about death. Some of them are just kind of bizarre, but some of them are like, say, from the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, with getting wings. Well, I have a lot of flying in my background, without going into that. Wings kind of sound cool to me, but on the other hand, as someone who teaches biblical exegesis and how to properly interpret the scriptures, I can say I'm kind of skeptical. I don't really see that biblically. It's hard for me to go there when it comes to us getting wings. Angels, yeah, people, eh. But glory, glory is all over the scriptures. Moses glowed just spending time with God in his presence at the top of Mount Sinai. He glowed again here, as did Elijah. And of course, Jesus is momentarily shown for who he really is, at least a little bit of it. And he glows. And I mean so shiny that we're not meant to look at that for so long. It's like looking at the sun, or rather, the sun is a mere stand-in from this temporal realm for the much more substantial eternal realm. So properly said, the sun shines like Jesus because it's the derivative thing, as all stars are, not the other way around. So, mess with your heads a little bit. Future you. Can you hold this? Future you will shine like that. It's also your destiny and inheritance. So all who love God and are called according to his purpose have this in store. And at first you want to, maybe you say, that's just strange and random. Why would I want to be a light bulb? That's just kind of strange. But that's part 
of what awaits for you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, glory in some sense is also fame. In this case, not fame with people, as in everybody knows your name, but fame with God, as in, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's glory. But there's also this undeniable thing about just shining. I'm going to move on to my second point this week on what it will be like. <sighs> Talking about death, that is the process of our bodies shutting down. That now, because um, so often and so much of the time, uh, there is drugs involved with that, morphine to kind of keep people comfortable or like that, uh, that people are often just kind of out of it. So this is less common. But before drugs were common, the doctors actually had seen it so much they had a term for it. It's called the wandering eye phenomenon at people's passing. People close to their own passing would see and talk to those not present. Like they were in a doorway and could talk to and see people on the other side that you could not yet see. It was actually so common there was a, a medical term for it. Well, in the, just in the last few weeks, as I've been sharing with a few people that I'm going to do these two sermon series on eternal life and talking about some of these things, I've had two now today, three stories of this. The first one was Dr. Joe Johnson, who um, sometimes stays with uh, uh, Dr. Glesney, Dave and, and, and Mona, but they had family with him so that he stayed with Levon and I uh, for five nights while he was teaching at the Master's Institute. Uh, and, uh, and he told me one, which kind of blew me away. And then there was someone uh, here after this service uh, at Redeemer last week. And then this morning, uh, actually, Terry told me the, a story about her mom's passing. I'm just going to read you one of these accounts. This is from Amy Carmichael's writing. She was a missionary in India working with orphanages. Some of you may have read Amy Carmichael. This goes back a few years. She died a couple years before I was born. But I'm going to read you Lala's story. Amy Carmichael wrote this. Her name was Lala. She was five years old, a Brahmin child of much promise. She had sickened suddenly with an illness we knew from the first must be dangerous. We could not ask a medical missionary to leave his hospital a day and a half distance for the sake of one child, but we did the best we could. We sent an urgent message to a medical evangelist trained at Nahor who lived near. And he came at once, but he arrived an hour too late. Before he came, we had seen this. It was in that chilly hour between night and morning, a lantern burned dimly in the room where Lala lay. There was nothing in that darkened room to account for what we saw. The child was in pain, struggling for breath, turning to us for what we could not give. I left her with Mabel Wade and Panamia, and going to a side room, cried out for the father to take her quickly. I was not more than a minute away, but when I returned, she was radiant. Her little lovely face was lighted with amazement and happiness. She was looking up and clapping her hands as delighted children do. When she saw me, she stretched out her arms and flung them around my neck as though saying goodbye in a hurry to be gone. Then she turned to the others in the same eager way. And then again, holding out her arms to someone whom we could not see, she clapped her hands. Had only one of us seen this thing, we might have doubted, but we all three saw it. There was no trace of pain in her face. She was never going to taste pain again. We saw nothing in that dear child's face but unimaginable delight. We looked where she was looking, almost thinking that we could see what she saw. What must the fountain of joy be if the spray from the edge of the pool can be like that. You will, as the scriptures I read last week, as a believer, not die alone. You will be received, welcomed. Jesus has made a place for you, and he is so good that it's hard to overstate what that means. Third point. What difference does this make now? What do we do with this? It helps us. When we have a functional understanding of eternal life, it helps us, inspires us to develop life 
in God's kingdom now, day by day, to step in to the unseen. In other words, we need to be now practicing the life which will be fulfilled in the future. So we need to be counting on it, counting on the kingdom day by day. Galatians 6, Paul writes this, the one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And that's not something just for after our bodies quit functioning. We step into that life now. Eternal life is entered now in the everyday, mundane choices of living. The fruit of the Spirit is part of that life. We know it well. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Humility is a place we come to where we no longer trust in ourselves, but we trust in him. We do our best, but we don't trust our best. We trust in him humbly seeing that which is not seen. The psalmist, Psalm 1, delights in the law and he meditates on the law day and night because the psalmist finds it pleasing to them. Why? Because it's instructions in how to live that life, how to live in the kingdom. So like in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says things that just seem beyond us, we can and we have the option to choose to say, for example, bless those who curse us as apprentices of Jesus even though it's a little bit like going to a gym and seeing the trainer that's going to work with you press like twice your body weight and then he comes to you and starts with like a PVC pipe by itself. <laughs> Just do that. You go through the motions. You start where you're at. Bless those who curse me. Well, how about if I just start trying not to have contempt for them and malign them? And I ask moment by moment for the grace of the Holy Spirit to enable me just to do that much. Long obedience in the same direction, always aided by God's grace to accomplish in us what we cannot do on his own. That's what grace is. It changes us if we choose to. It will restore our soul. We won't finish that process here, but we can grow. We are in training for eternity. You are in training for a creative governance, for reigning. And again, from last week, Christ-like power, and I will add this week, Christ-like glory and Christ-like character are parts of the same thing. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. They go together. And all these other things will be added to you as well. It's in the day-to-day -day seeking him that we begin to walk more and more into a life that does not end. And then lastly, I'll say again, what do we do with this functional understanding of eternity now? Well, we treat others in its light. We treat others in the light of their true eternal nature. We treat others and learn slowly to treat others in light of this, which is all the fruit of the Spirit. Your family, your children, your neighbors, strangers, those that we may find repulsive. Sometimes we may find ourselves repulsive, and we got to remember who we are. In fact, we want to remember who all are invited to be. And teaching at MI, the Master's Institute, and training future pastors, we trained it. I work with them to understand how to properly interpret the scriptures. And part of that is technical as literary context and historical context and all that. I'm going to read something, but I'm going to give you just a little bit, not too much, of the historical context of these words. I think it was about September 7th of 1940. Nazi Germany began intense bombing of England to prepare to invade. It continued September October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. And in that political historical context, on June 8th, 1941, at solemn evensong in the 12th century Oxford University Church of St. Mary the Virgin, to one of the largest congregations 
ever assembled there in modern times, C.S. Lewis gave what has been for me all my adult life since I first read it, one of my favorite sermons of the 20th century on this topic of the weight of glory. It has affected my worldview for more than four decades, and I will read but a snippet of my favorite parts, but I encourage you to search for it. It's still probably copyrighted, but I know you can get a PDF online if you look for it. But better yet, buy a copy. I do heartily recommend it in its entirety. In that historical context, Lewis said this, the load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid upon my back. A load so heavy, only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken by it. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in your nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It's in the light of those overwhelming possibilities, and it's in the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all love, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit, betray. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. If he is your Christian neighbor, he is holy in almost the same way. In him, Christ and Lewis could just quote Latin at this point, he's at Oxford, is very Latin town. The glorifier and the glorified, glory himself is truly hidden. John Newton, an ex-human trafficker, slave ship captain who wrote Amazing Grace, saved a wretch like me, also penned this. When we've been dead 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Who is going to shine? You are. St. John writes that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be remade. We shall someday be remade to be able not only to withstand his presence, his glory, but it will truly be normal. It will be our light, Revelation 22.5. They will not need the light of the lamp, who's they, us, or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign with him forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord God, by your grace, shine the light of the gospel into our understanding that we might have a real vital, functional vision of eternal life that takes hold of us so that it is a light to our feet and enlightens our daily path. To you, O Lord, be the glory. For yours is the glory. You are glory himself. Amen. Eric, I want to thank you for answering the Lord's call to be with us for these last two weeks and for bringing our attention to the reality is that we are living in eternity now and that we do have Christ in us, the hope of glory. 
and we have that weight of glory and that we can look at those around us um, with the glory that they have for the way that they have been created. And so, Redeemer, I would like to invite you in showing our appreciation to what the Lord has given us these last two weeks. And with that, I invite you to rise and extend your hands to receive the benediction. As you leave this place and you shine, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his perfect peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's saints together said, Amen. Have a glorious week in the Lord. Hey, I'm Isaac. I'm the worship director here at Redeemer. Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you're new here, I want to invite you to take your next step by visiting our website at redeemermn.org slash next steps, where we can get you connected and set you up with some free resources on us. If this message made an impact on you, like and share it with a friend. This is so much more than just another video online. It's a community. It's a place of worship and most importantly, a church. So share it and be a part of helping others get connected too. And if you've only experienced Redeemer online, we want to invite you to check us out in person. There are things that God does in the community when you meet face to face that don't happen any other way. So if you've never been or haven't been in a long time, I want to invite you to come check us out next Sunday at 10.30. Again, thanks for worshiping with us. Jesus loves you and we do too. See you next week.